whereas I, I had started into pre-med uh, in school in San Francisco, eventually that just fell away too. I couldn't think of anything other than Kung Fu. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. This is episode 147, and thank you for tuning in. On this episode, we hear from a well-known author and practitioner of Chinese martial arts, Mr. Michael Staples. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the web's best podcast on the traditional martial arts twice a week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the host of the show and the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you checking us out. I hope you enjoy your time here today. Our sparring helmets are probably the most comfortable head protection you'll ever wear in a martial arts class or, honestly, for anything. If you don't like them, we'll give you all of your money back. With free shipping every day, there's no risk. Check them out at whistlekick.com and get yours today. If you want the show notes, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's also the easiest place to sign up for our great newsletter. In each of the issues we send out, You get special content, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. As a thank you for joining, we'll send you some discounts, as well as give you access to our top 10 tips for martial artists, an exclusive never-before-never-will-be-aired podcast episode. On the show, we've been fortunate enough to hear from a number of guests that have talked about the early days of martial arts in America. Today's guest brings us that perspective on the Chinese martial arts, specifically in California, and his early days training. We hear several times how Mr. Michael Staples' life was altered dramatically and seemingly by forces beyond understanding. What you hear in today's episode is the story of someone who was destined to be the martial artist they became. Let's welcome him to the show. Mr. Staples, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much for having me, Jeremy. It's a pleasure to have you here. and Looking forward to hearing all about you and what you've got going on. And, And I know there's some specific things we're going to talk about as we move through, but we always like to get started in the same way because it gives us an idea of who you are so we can talk about more things as, as we move along. How did you get started in the martial arts? Well, it probably uh, actually goes back to when I was maybe 12 or 13 years old. Uh, and um, I think that there were, there, you know, one of the questions for me that I, that comes out in my book is is really why did I get uh, uh, interested in the martial arts? But the how of it probably started right around that time. I, I was pretty young, but we're talking about the uh, the early '60s, maybe '61, uh, yeah, maybe '62, uh, and I think that I I picked up the interest uh, from watching um, uh, a, a, a a series on television. Uh, and remember that, that you know at that time there wasn't a whole lot uh, known about uh, uh, a karate or and, and even less about kung fu uh, in in the U.S. I mean Ed Parker was out there and and there were others too, but uh, it was still a pretty exotic thing. Uh, and even though I got you know interested and started surrounding myself with uh, with books, uh, there were no teachers in my area, so I couldn't really sustain. The uh, uh, the interest for uh, uh, for very long. Uh, it surfaced again when I came back from Vietnam, uh, and I was in the Marine Corps. I was actually in San Clemente working with the Secret Service as a as a bomb disposal expert, and uh, suddenly I found myself once again that this in uh, this uprising of interest that, that turned into a, an obsession very quickly. So probably some of your listeners can, can relate to that. Uh, and I found myself uh, uh, standing in the doorway of uh, one of Fumio Demora's uh, little offshoot uh, dojos in San Clemente. Uh, and that's uh, uh, that's where it, it really got off, off the ground in, in a big way. Um, and for my last year in the Marine Corps, uh, that's pretty much all I thought about and breathed and uh, uh, did, really, uh, outside of, of the Marine Corps. I would take 20-day leaves and just spend it in the dojo, uh, going from one class to another. And when they ran out of classes, I would drive to Santa Ana, uh, where Sensei Demora's uh, main school was, 
and continue with classes out there. Uh, so that was my my introduction to karate, really. Uh, and then when I got out of the Marine Corps, I was uh, I, I had a job that was supposed to materialize in San Francisco, so I had to I had to move up there. It never did, by the way, never did materialize. But uh, I was then in San Francisco, uh, looking around for uh, another place like uh, Fumio de Moros, and having a really hard time finding it. I think it was, you know, I was looking for a spot that that had that that ambiance of uh, Japanese and Okinawan that that feel, you know, with the tatami mats, but also something that was really hard uh, because at Demore's place, at least for me and for uh, a, a small group, it was the kind of thing where you're working until you drop down into a pool of your own sweat and then you pick yourself up and, and start over you know this kind of thing yeah yeah uh, and so that's what I was looking for and I wasn't really comfortable with the places that I I had been but I finally sort of zeroed in on one that was uh, a uh, a school that was being run by Kosi Yamaguchi and so one evening I, I packed up my my gi and I went over to his place and I walked through the door and I said, okay, uh, I'm ready to sign up. So there were a couple of students behind a, a desk there that uh, said, well, uh, Sensei likes to come out and talk to people before they, they start up. So just have a seat over there and wait. But while I was sitting there, these two guys were talking um, uh, between themselves about a, a Kung Fu practitioner that had come up uh, to spar with some of, uh, of the karate students so that they could, you know, I guess they invited him up there so they get a sense of something different. And I was listening to them talk and they, they were so enthusiastic and kind of in awe of, of this guy that uh, uh, I was really sort of on the edge of my seat waiting for them to say, well, where did he come from? And they finally told me, that, or they told themselves, you know, they said, yeah, he's down on Gary Street. So I, I actually packed up my gi and I said, you know, guys, I, I'll be back in a little while. And the next thing I knew, I was, I was standing outside uh, this white crane school uh, in, in San Francisco on, on Gary Street. So things were about to change for me. So instead of being in, in karate, I was going to make this major shift to uh, Kung Fu. So there's a pivotal moment there of course you know here, here you are you know training in in karate japanese okinawan influences and it sounded like it really worked for you so i've got to ask what was it while you were sitting there waiting in this you know what really sounds like this kind of movie moment what was it about hearing these two discuss this kung excuse me kung fu individual that made you get up and walk out yeah, that's a that's a, a very good question. You know, I I don't know what it was that that got me to stand up and, and walk out. You know, I have some some guesses from a psychological point of view, and in my book, I that's kind of what I'm trying to get at. I was uh, in the book, for instance, I, I make a distinction between the uh, the, the the beauty. Uh, the, the lightness, the, the surroundings that uh, I experienced at, uh, at Demora's dojo, as opposed to the kind of dark, underground, secretive um, uh, atmosphere of, of Kung Fu. And so there was a kind of a shift in that direction that spoke to something inside me so that Kung Fu and the martial arts in general were kind of an outward expression of something that uh, an internal event. Um, and it's, it was really kind of interesting because here I was out there looking for all of this, uh, 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 you know, something like Demora's with the sparkly white gi belt and you know all of the tatami mats and, and everything that goes with karate 
And I'm standing outside now this, this uh, a white crane school that is absolutely horrible. I mean, it, it's, it used to be, it looked like it used to be a beauty parlor that was sort of converted. And it had this, these cheesy drawings uh, on, on, the, on the big plate glass window outside. And I just kind of went, yeah, well, <clears throat> um, probably not. I'm going to go in anyway and see what's in there. I was drawn uh, by this this inner urge to just go check it out. So I go in and I have a seat. And in the middle of the floor, and it's a, just a linoleum floor, right? I mean, it isn't it isn't even tatami mats. I mean, I'm just going, oh, how could I be interested in this? And standing in the middle of the floor is a student. Uh, and he doesn't have a gi. He has like blue jeans and a sweatshirt. You know, so <laughs> this is, you know, I, I, things are looking worse by the minute. And he's kind of flailing around uh, uh, with these techniques. And I, you know, I started looking at these techniques, and I went, "You've got to be joking." I mean, you just really have to be joking. I mean, this, there's got to be something more than this, because. Uh, it looks like something that you know. I would just walk over and you know, uh, block these these arm swings that he's doing and punch him in the nose, and that'd be the end of that. But as I'm sitting there and I'm watching this, uh, Mr. Long, George Long, who's the master of, of uh, the white crane style, uh, appears uh, in one of the doors and spots me over there, uh, sitting there uh, watching uh, Steve, who's in the middle of the floor, and. Uh, he starts making a beeline for me. And, you know, honestly, I mean, he looks like a used car salesman. <laughs> he's, he's, he's got this little Chinese vest on and, you know, he's kind of a short guy, kind of stocky. And he comes uh, he comes over to me and, and sticks a card in my hand and, and starts kind of making a pitch for uh, uh, how, what he calls, sophisticate uh, the white crane style is. And, he says, well, you want to watch some sparring? And I said, well, yeah, uh, that, that, would be, that would be good. Because, you know, I was thinking, well, you know, let's see how this stuff works. There's got to be something that impressed those guys up at Yamaguchi's. I mean, the Yamaguchi's students are, are you know, pretty rugged. So Mr. Long tells, tells Steve, he says, go get Ron. So, uh, uh. Steve disappears around the door and, and finally brings this this little guy out. It's not that little, but kind of muscular and uh, and thin. And that was Ron, and that was the guy that was up at uh, Yamaguchi's. I found out. Uh, so I thought, well, okay. So anyway, these two guys square off in the middle of this linoleum floor. And they just start going at each other like crazy. I mean, they are just blasting away at each other. There's kicks, there's punches everywhere, and Steve is just chasing uh, after Ron with everything he's got. They're not, they're not pulling any punches. But Ron is, is like, like a ballet dancer. I mean, he's just slipping things left and right, and he's not getting hit at all. He's like uh, being carried. Uh, into unique angles and just at one point he just kind of pops up in the air and flips around with the back of his head and just s smacks Steve in, in the forehead uh, and ends up behind him and I was just I was I was floored I mean my my mouth was hanging over I couldn't believe what I was seeing and Mr. you know Mr. Long was right next to me kind of giggling uh, and again, he says, pretty sophisticated, huh? And all I could say was, you know, the, these guys didn't have any uniforms on, but they, they both had these little slippers on, these little Chinese slippers. And I said, where do I get the slippers? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that was it. After watching that, I was, uh, I was sucked into that uh, completely. Wow. And how could you not be? You know, here yeah, you, you went in and something's calling you in, but yet at the same time you had no expectations. 
or, yeah, or, or I, even negative expectations. That, that's right. I, I probably at that point I had negative expectations. I was not expecting to see anything like that. And the fact is that that White Crane is so unique that um, even now uh, I, I don't think there are very. I mean, there are very few people who who've ever seen it in, in action. Um, it's not the white crane of Shaolin. It's completely different from Shaolin and all of Shaolin's offshoots. So if you have Shaolin and then you, you know, you have all these things like the white crane style of Shaolin and the snake and the tiger and you know all of those, those different things. But those are all linear styles, whereas white crane is a circular style. And there's a huge difference between the two. Uh, so from my training and my perspective coming in there as from a linear style. Uh, I looked at that and I, you know, my, my first view of it was, you, you've got to be joking. And I couldn't see how that would work. And it's actually the kind of thing that even when you're watching it, you can't really see how it's going to work. Now, as it turns out, the things, there's a couple of things that, that make it work. The, the main thing is the footwork. But what makes the footwork work is the horse. And it's a unique horse. So the footwork and the horse make the long arm work. Without those things, it doesn't work at all. Or you could just walk in and you know block the these long arm punches, and that's the end of that. So those styles that use long arm that are still linear styles, it doesn't work very well. Right and that was what was unique for me. You know, I, I looked at that and I went, how in the, how, did, how do you do that? <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting. And I think for me, it's, it's the interesting styles that draw me to them. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I find so often that when someone starts in any style and they, they see some success or, or some enjoyment or, or something about it resonates, people either go to exactly the same thing or, or that's their goal or they end up doing something completely different. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mm -hmm. seem to be a lot of just kind of different. You know, we're ta not talking 30 degrees. We're talking, you know, three degrees different or 180. Yeah. And that's what you did. You went the complete 180 route and it sounds like it was the best thing for you. Yeah. It, yes. It was the best thing for me. Um, now, there, I mean, there was a downside to it. The downside is that, uh, as it turned out, uh, my obsession for the martial arts uh, really sort of tacked me into a different, let me see how to put this, I, everything else dropped away. So, whereas I, I had started into pre-med uh, in school in San Francisco, eventually that just fell away too. So, I couldn't think of anything other than Kung Fu. And um, I think that in the long run, that was to my detriment. So for instance, it, 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 even the other things that were presented to me, for instance, uh, Mr. Long started gravitating more toward uh, his acupuncture practice. Uh, and that was an, that's an interesting story too, to tell you the truth, because back then acupuncture was still illegal. And the police would uh, make these sort of little half-hearted raids around town and because of the Chinese community in, in San Francisco. Uh, there were uh, there were people, you know, doing acupuncture, and they they sort of knew who they were. And every now and then they would go in and they would raid the guy and drag him away, and you know, and then release him, and he'd go back and, to doing what he was doing. Uh, so, uh, but it was illegal. And there, there was no, there were no boards or anything like that for establishing certification or anything like that. But Mr. Long was, was quite, he was crafty. He was very strong mentally and very crafty. And one day the police showed up at our place and dragged Mr. Long away in, in cuffs. <laughs> but it was all kind of part of a plan he had because what he did is he had this very high-powered attorney who tied up the courts for you know almost forever. I think it was just a couple of years that uh, uh, that he tied him up, and 
somehow or other, he maneuvered it around so that Mr. Long could continue practicing what he was doing until the courts uh, decided that it was illegal. Wow. You know, what he was doing was illegal. <laughs> and he just, the attorney just made sure that they never came to that conclusion. So for a long time, uh, he, uh, Mr. Long was the only one around, probably in California, who could actually continue to practice. Oh, what a but it, Yeah, no, it was funny. But one of the things he did was he offered both Ron, who was the uh, uh, the head student uh, initially, and me, uh, the uh, the ability to or the option of going in and, and studying acupuncture with him. Uh, I of course turned it down flat because all I could think about was being out on the floor, kicking and punching, and and getting better at at at, uh, at kung fu. And I think that in the long run. Uh, that worked against me because, really, I, I never wanted to be a you know uh, 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 an, an owner of a school uh, you know like that. So I, I missed out on something there because of, because of my obsession. Well, I think that the majority of us listening to the show, or, you know, I'm, I'm certainly going to lump myself in here, have passed up on quite a number of things because of our passion for the martial arts. And yeah, I think yeah. any time that you really want to develop anything at a high level or, or even a, a moderately high level, it requires some sacrifice. Absolutely. And, and I'm not saying that, that anybody who gets, uh, you know, really obsessive about uh, studying the martial arts is, is making a mistake. I, I'm not saying that at all. I'm looking more in, as to what was going on for me personally uh, and the kinds of obsessions that I had that were really, as I developed the book, uh, I started to understand that that my, my obsessions led back to my own childhood. And in my childhood, uh, how the defenses that I constructed back then uh, as a result of a, a, a very traumatic childhood were playing out in the decisions that I was making uh, later in life all, all along the way, and how some of the unconscious defense mechanisms that I had uh, were leading me in in you know down a path that uh, uh, was was not conscious. I mean, uh, it's it's probably better to to make to be as conscious as possible about the reasons why you're doing things. Anyway, sure, uh, sure. So. But here I am, I'm in this, you know, I'm studying like crazy and I, I become the, you know, the, uh, the top student on the floor uh, eventually. And I, uh, I, I'm, I'm still reading all, everything that I can. I'm just trying to suck up all the, the information I can about Kung Fu. And th there really isn't anything out there. You know, Robert Smith had a few books out that were really quite good. You know, he was, he had, landed these uh, uh, Kodansha International uh, as a publisher. And so he had a book out on Bakwa, which is interesting, and one on Xing Yi, and he teamed up with Don Dreger to, to write this uh, Asian martial arts, um, or Asian fighting arts, I think it was called, book, which was, was quite good. Uh, and there were, there were a few others that were mostly published by um, uh, O'Hara Publications. Uh, and O'Hara was the one who published both the Black Belt magazine and the uh, a Karate Illustrated magazine, which were pretty much the the leading uh, karate magazines, uh, you know, in the states. And oh, so O'Hara also published a few books, like uh, you know, on Charlie Foot, a few other things. But overall, there wasn't the kind of uh, uh, information back then that there that there is now. Uh, you know, like Mir Shahar's book on the Shaolin Monastery, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's incredible. That's the book I, I always wanted to write back then. <laughs> but what, what happened was that uh, as I was studying the White Crane, uh, you know, I'm, and, and I'm, I'm reading these magazines, you know, I, I wrote a letter to the editor and I said, um, you should come down and write a uh uh, an article on White Crane, the stuff that I'm studying, because, you know, nobody's ever seen this stuff before. And it's, you, you should get down here and do it. And they wrote me back 
And they said, hey, we'll publish it if you write it. So I, I went, okay, I mean, I haven't written anything before, so uh, I'll give it a shot. And that's where the writing started. You know, I wrote the first article in, in English on uh, White Crane. And that appeared in the Black Belt magazine. And then they, they wanted more. So Black Belt wanted more. And then, you know, uh, uh, Karate Illustrated wanted more. Uh, and I just kept writing. But it wasn't because I was really interested in becoming a writer. It, what I was really interested in was that I figured out that I could go around to the other uh, Kung Fu masters uh, in, in San Francisco and sort of bribe them uh, <laughs> into showing me what they were so showing me what they were doing. So in other words, I'd go in and, and I, I would say, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to write an article about you, but you have to show me what you're doing and explain everything. <laughs> what, what a perfect disguise for someone who, who is so passionate about martial arts. You know, I, I would describe myself as a martial arts nerd, and I, I haven't thought of doing it that way, but maybe now I should. Yeah, maybe. It's, show yeah. me your best stuff. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a writer. Exactly. And that's, that's what I did. But you remember that back then, these, nobody knew anything. You know, so I was, I was writing all of these, uh, uh, just, you know, one after another after another of these styles that had never before been written about in English. So Bach May and, you know, some of these things that were very exotic. Um, yeah, so that's, that's how the, the writing started. And then, you know, I figured, well, what the heck? I might as well, I'm gathering all this information. I might as well do a book. So I, I did the first book on, on the White Crane style. And it was O'Hara Publications that, that published it. And, you know, it sold really well. And people seemed to be interested in it. Um, and then later, there would, be, there would be more. There would be one on Hop Gaw. The first, you know, that would be the first book uh, about Hop Gaw in English. Um, and, uh, uh, that just kept, the ball kept rolling like that. Awesome. Uh, let's so talk, pretty, let's talk sure. a little bit more about the books as, as we get, as we get in later. Cause I, I do want to spend some time focused talking about, about the book specifically, but I think we've got a good, a good spot to, to take another step to another question here. Sure. Because, you know, now, now we've started to hear about who you are. Your, your ties in the martial arts. And now we're starting to understand how you're branching out, how you're starting to bring your martial arts back into life. You know, yes. your, your passion is, is starting to show up with you as a writer. Now I'm, I'm sure as you were traveling around, as you've written these books, you've had a lot of stories and we, we've heard a few already. And, and it, honestly, this really does sound like the makings of a movie to me, but you know, maybe, maybe you've already got a screenplay written for all I know. <laughs> if I was to pin you down and, and say, tell us your best story, what would that one be? My best story. It's, it's hard to figure out what the best story would, would be, really. Um, I could tell you a story about uh, 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 George Long, Mr. Long. And how he uh, one day decided uh, to start throwing things at me. Um, he had this this technique for throwing um, uh, uh, coins, and so he would he would he would stand across the room, and I, I mean I knew it was coming, and he would toss this coin at me, you know, at, at like supersonic speed, you know, it'd be like a quarter and it would, it would hit and it would just leave, you know, it would really be, uh, leave a welt. And every time I turned around and, and wasn't watching it, I could hear these things coming at me. And, you know, at the time it was not, it was not funny. Uh, I was getting really uh, upset and this went on for quite some time, uh, until I started, you know, uh, being very careful about where I was walking, and if I went around 
you know, I went around a wall. I made sure that I gave it a wide berth so that he wouldn't be popping out at me. Uh, he actually, at one point, changed uh, to a broom handle, and he would be popping out from you know these these corners, and you know, I'd get smacked with a, with a broom handle. And I was, um, uh, you know, getting kind of depressed about the whole thing actually. Uh, so we had this we had this big pot of of uh, what's called dit da jiao, it's uh, or tia da jiao, um, which is a medicine uh, that uh, we'd have to soak our hands in after training our hands, and uh, the pot was was on a stove, uh, and it's a large pot. You'd have to put your hands in in the uh, uh, in the brew, uh, and it was, and it, it would be hot. It would be you know pretty hot. I mean, you still put your hand in it, but the it, there was also a rule about no dripping. You know, you don't want to drip this stuff around. It's kind of smelly, so you don't want to get get it all over the kitchen. And Mr. Long had a, a a knack for attacking me in places where I was the most vulnerable. So I'm I'm in there. I've got I've got my one hand already stuck in this thing, and there was just I could I could just hear this whizzing behind me that I had come to. No, it was a broom handle coming down on me. And I've got my hand stuck in this thing. I can't get out of the way and I can't pull my hand out. And I'm not I'm not thinking about what I'm gonna do. All I did was hear that that broom handle coming down. And with my other hand, I reached down and I grabbed the, the lid and flipped around and blocked the uh, uh, the broom handle coming down. It was, it was this giant clang. And I, you know, I, I went, oh my God, what have I done? I probably, I probably made him mad. You know, I looked at him and he was just staring at me. And I thought he's going to probably haul off and hit me again. And instead, you know, he just pointed his finger at my nose, and he said, "Now you know." And he turned around and walked away. That was the end of it. There was no more broom handles. There were no more. Uh, coins coming at me. So I'm not exactly sure what now I know, but <laughs> <laughs> there's something in there. <laughs> wow. That is, you know, that's the kind of stuff that we, you know, we, we see in classic Kung Fu films, but I can't say I've ever spoken with anyone who experienced it firsthand. Do you think yeah. it was teaching you that the, the obvious lesson of just to be aware or was there something more to it? I think later on, as I as I started working with the energy uh, involved with, uh, the, there was kind of a feeling that uh, uh, that an energy that goes up right through your back. Uh, I, you know, I was onto it at that point because I, not initially, but after I thought about it, that when you're surprised, you know how you're surprised and you kind of go oh, like that, and you you get this. This chi, this energy is just kind of rising up on you. Um, sometimes it, it, it makes you take a breath like that. Yeah. And uh, uh, what, what it had done, what he had showed me was how to link that up to a move. So it's a spontaneous uh, move uh, that is in response to an attack. So he was providing the attack, and he was just kind of waiting for me to 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 recognize uh, how that energy inside me was was being linked up that way. And later on, I, I tried to teach that to, to others too, so that you know I would stand behind them sometimes, and I would just make some kind of noise to try to startle them, and I'd say, "Feel that, feel that, feel the chi rising, feel feel that coming up in you now." Let's link that up to something. And uh, I think that he, that's what he was getting at. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's a story. <laughs> I'd like yeah. you to t think of a time now in your life where things weren't going so well. You know, you had some kind of personal challenge or, or maybe it was a, a physical challenge, whatever it was. 
Tell us about that and how your experience as a martial artist allowed you to overcome that challenge. Mm. You know, but let me go back first back to Demoris, just sure. to just to sort of put this in here because it it it's a it's a feeling that was with me all the way through the martial arts. At the Moore's Dojo, one of the things that that impacted me more than anything else, I mean, of course, there was all the, the kicking and the punching, and Demora was this fabulous, this um, this fabulous uh, sensei who represented, you know, someone who was strong and you know all this stuff. But there would before his classes be a lot of milling around. Everybody was kind of, you know, doing warming up and kicking and punching and stuff like that. And uh, all of a sudden, Demora would sort of burst through a doorway and be out in the middle of the floor. And you couldn't, uh, you couldn't understand what he was saying sometimes because he had this very gruff voice. We used to think it was because of all the key eyes that, that he did. It was rah, 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 sort of like that. And he would sort of grunt something and as I say in the book, we don't, probably nobody understood what he said, but everybody understood what he meant. And we would line up on the floor in front of him and be down on our knees and sort of do a couple of things. But right at the end of that, there was a pause for maybe only 30 seconds where you, where you stopped and you, you breathed and you were silent. And that silence, impacted me more than probably anything else. That's what stayed with me. I mean, I can sort of remember the, you know, the kicks and the techniques and stuff like that, but it was that silence that really grabbed me. Now, later on, when I'm in San Francisco, my mother died and it was very traumatic and it threw me into a depression for, for weeks. I mean, I was really descending into a, a real blackness that was there. I couldn't get out of it. I could barely get out of the house to walk. Uh, school was crashing. You know, my finances were crashing. Everything was coming down. And I was walking along, and this is this is how I, I happened on to Yamaguchi School. I was walking, uh, walking along the, I guess it was a sidewalk, when um, someone sort of jumped out of a, a car and ran up in a gi and ran up these stairs. And I looked up there and I could see that this was a, this was something's going on in there. So it's like a, a, a dojo. And I think, it, I, as I recall, there was some, there was a name up there. and It might've been uh, uh, Yamaguchi's name. And anyway, I, I went up the stairs too. It was, it was hard actually. I remember, you know, I, like I say, I was so depressed I could barely walk. But I, I went in and I stood in the doorway uh, looking into uh, the class that was going on uh, that was actually being held on a, I think it was a basketball court. <laughs> and I'm standing there and he starts uh, the, the class doing uh, this uh, Sanchen Kata, this breathing exercise, this, this uh, uh, it, it's a dynamic tension uh, exercise. And internally, I started doing it too. I'm sort of standing in the in the doorway. But as he's breathing, I can see the, the breath going down and I start breathing down. And I start experiencing again, that silence uh, that that was at Demora's place. And I started feeling better. I started, you know, instead of leaning up against the door jam, I started standing up straighter. And uh, uh, you know, my, my attitude started get, uh, uh, you know, uh, coming back to life. Uh, and then I, I started to sink back down into it because I left after that. But when I went home, I started re-accessing uh, that silence and that, that deep meditation state. Uh, and I started to... Uh, uh, to come around, and it was it was shortly after that, maybe only a week after that, that I was wrapping up my gi and heading off to Yamaguchi's school to join up. 
Wow. Now, yeah. Now that that plays out later on too. I mean, uh, I end up uh, being quite isolated uh, on on purpose. Um, you know, this is part of the book too. Uh, in a uh, uh, a cabin uh, that my family owned that was very secluded, uh, and reaccessing that that silence and that what in Zen is called shikantaza. To find the pieces of myself that began back in my childhood that were driving my interests and the decisions that I was making. And because of that, uh, that, that, that accessing of that deeper part of me, uh, I was able to bring out and make more conscious those things that had uh, uh, taken hold um, when I was just a child. Mm. Wow. It's powerful stuff. And, you know, there seems to be this recurring theme here for you. of Things seemingly happened at exactly the right time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's right. Stuff. That's it's stuff. interesting. You know, uh, another whole phase that sort of opened up for me was, you know, as I, as I was coming back from, uh, I don't know where I was coming back from, but I just charged into my, my uh, uh, apartment on Knob Hill and the phone was ringing. So I grab up the phone and by now I'm doing a lot of writing. Okay. I'm, I'm writing for, you know, six or seven different martial arts magazines and that sort of thing. And my editor is on the phone and uh, from Black Belt. And he said, Oh, I'm glad we just, we're glad we finally caught up with you. There's a, a Kung Fu group from China that we set you up with an, a, an appointment with. Uh, they're going to be down at the Holiday Inn. You know, it's not too far from where I am. Get down there right now. <laughs> and I said, oh, these guys are from where? From Taiwan? And he said, no, from Beijing. And I went, you got to be joking. Because at that time, China was still completely locked up. It's not like it is now. I mean, you couldn't go to China. You couldn't get out of China. You know, they had just come through their cultural revolution, and they'd been locked down tight since the end of World War II, the last 40 years. And Kung Fu was driven underground. So Kung Fu was considered one of the four, one of the, the four olds. It was like considered to be passe and the government was trying to run Buddhism and all of that stuff out, and Kung Fu was in there too. Got to get rid of it. So all of a sudden, there's this group that is not only on their way but without any advance notice, and they're sitting right down on on Van Ness Avenue waiting for me. <laughs> and you know they're not calling it Kung Fu; they're calling it Wushu, which makes sense. So this this is the Beijing wushu team and and i've been set up with a you know so i just grab everything i can you know i didn't have any chance to prepare or think about what what i was going to do i just grab grab up my camera and I, I go charging down there uh and that that becomes the the start of a uh, uh, a relationship with the with the beijing team that, that i had so, and that, that ends up with another book, by the way, the, uh, called The Wushu of China and, and a magazine and, and a bunch of articles and stuff like that. And my partner, who turns out to be this, this uh, Chinese kid who's uh, uh, also very interested in the, Be in the Beijing team and finds a way to work himself in, into their, their good graces, um, we team up. And that, that was Anthony Chan. And, and Anthony becomes the very first person, the outsider, to study with the team in, in China. And so he goes over there and, and uh, comes back with these, these uh, wushu sets. And I, I'm telling you, Jeremy, when, when he brought that back, when he brought this set back uh, into competition, and I'm sitting up there in the bleachers, and Anthony's going to do this, uh, this uh, chain uh, routine in, in uh, uh, karate competition. It's the first time anybody's done it, right? First time anybody's seen wushu, really, you know, competitively, in, at least, you know, in, uh, in, I think in the United States. And 
you know, as a representative of, of the uh, uh, official wushu that's going on in, in, in uh, Beijing. And he goes out there in this sparkly white suit with these these uh, these steel whips, and you could, I mean, it was just amazing. You know, he was so far so far ahead of the game. I was just going, you guys. So, so I was I was taking pictures left and right, and oh, you know, cool. writing articles. We had this whole thing going with the with the team. Yeah. And but China eventually, you know, uh, gives us the first visas to to uh, and the ability to bring in small groups and take them to the Shaolin temple so we're we're actually running these little these little uh tourist uh groups over to the Shaolin temple which at that time was nothing like it is now i mean it was still covered with plants i mean they you know the government had just got through kind of closing it all down instead of opening it up the, the way that it is now so, <laughs> so that's my story about anthony yeah and there we have another story that, that's about timing. Yeah. Somehow the timing of, of your life, you've been in the right place at the right time. And I'm sure if we continue to dig, we'll hear even more. But I want to ask you an, an, another question, kind of taken in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Because it sounds like you've had the opportunity to train with quite a few amazing people. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we, we've, we've had... Demura Sensei on, on the show and, and anyone that knows anything about him knows that he's, you know, in, in a league of his own. And, you know, just from from talking about, uh, I forget the gentleman's name, but the white crane gentleman that you started training with, just I mean, right. clear, just, you know, an exceptional martial artist. And, and I'm sure that if we ran down the list of all the people you've trained with, we'd find plenty of other examples of, of absolutely amazing people, the Wushu team there. But if there was someone that you could train with that you haven't who would that be um it probably if, if i was to think of someone on the uh on the kung fu stage it would probably be uh maybe adam sue and adam sue uh was in san francisco i'm not sure where he is now but he was you know had quite a long uh pedigree in very interesting styles and He's actually the one who told me uh, that he's he's only interested in interesting styles, <laughs> and so he he had a a, a lot of um, a, a lot of experience there, and I I think you know uh, if if Colin Ying was around, uh, I think he died, but uh, if he was around, I, I would I would like to I would be gravitating more toward those meditative uh, uh, styles. Then, I mean, I'm old now. Okay, I'm old. I can't, <laughs> I can't be jumping around kicking people in the head anymore. <laughs> um, in fact, it, you know, it, my my orientation now would definitely be more toward Zen, and that is where Shaolin came from. I mean, Shaolin came from the Shaolin Temple. That was the the uh, the temple from which Chan Buddhism came from. Uh, and Chan, down through the ages, eventually ended up in Japan as, as Zen and had such a, a big impact on uh, the samurai. So I would, I would personally, that's where, where I would be going. It would be less of the kicking and punching, more of the just sitting. <laughs> but that's just me, because I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's kind of the beauty of martial arts is, you know, we, we get to, to flex and shift as our interests change. And we, we had someone on the show, I don't even know, remember what episode it, it was, and the episode may not have even gone out that, you know, when we're young, we tend to focus on the sparring aspects. But as we get older, we're, you know, we start to get banged up a little bit. So then it becomes about forms and basics. And then we get older still, and it becomes about the philosophy and the meditation and the breathing and some of those less physical aspects, but there's always something there. There's always something to work on and, and progress with. I think that's absolutely right. And, and you're right about that. I, you know, I think for me, the essence of Kung Fu is really not in the, the external kicking and punching part. Uh, although I, I had a, a wonderful time doing that. Uh, it's more where that 
kicking and punching sort of leads you uh, in, in as far as your your understanding of your own being and where where you are in the world. And that's why the the name of the book is, is focusing emptiness. You know, it's actually the emptiness part is from the uh, uh, from Chan Buddhism. Let's talk about your book. Mm -hmm. I mean, that this seems like a, like a good opportunity. Sure. You you've hinted at, at some of the aspects of it and some of the things you've talked about. I know you've written a number of books, and and we'll talk about. You know, I, I at least want to get a rundown of the names. And for anyone that's listening right now, you might be listening in a car, show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We'll have lists of all this, links to things and everything. So if you want to, um, you know, check out Mr. Staples' books, and I, I hope that you do because they're absolutely fantastic, you'll have that opportunity. But talk about this newest book of yours. Mm -hmm. it, it's quite different from the other books that I've written. Now, most of the other books, in fact, I think all of the other books are out of print now. So I, I see them floating around on, on Amazon for these ridiculous prices. <laughs> but uh, uh, this one is quite, quite different uh, because I'm not just exposing a style uh, of, of martial art. I'm, I'm really trying to get at what's under, underneath it for me. And in many cases, that other people can relate to that. So I, I wrote the book as a story. Um, uh, and I left, I didn't put anything in the story, uh, that is like psychological jargon, um, uh, analysis or, or anything like that. It's, it's a story that just simply starts from point A and, and goes to, you know, point B. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I keep, uh, and, and you don't you don't have to have any interest in psychology, or actually you don't have to have any interest in the martial arts. I, I don't think uh, to be interested in in a, a compelling story that that it is. Um, but uh, in the end, I, I in the epilogue is is where I put the uh, uh, some of the the more analytical stuff that is really what I'm getting at it at a lower level. Um, yeah. And so uh, it's based on, on, on my story, uh, just because that happens to be convenient. And in certain places, like my study of, of uh, Kung Fu, it, it provides these little keys to understanding what I'm getting at. You know, I, I actually mentioned a couple of them. I mentioned that, that feeling of, uh, of silence at Demora's Dojo, which came out again uh, with uh, Yamaguchi's school. And at each, at each one of these little points, I'm getting closer, although I don't know it, I'm getting closer to where I need to look in order to find those missing pieces, what I call the lost child, uh, that go back to my childhood. The pieces that have split off because of the trauma that I ex experienced and went underground. Um, yeah. Are you willing to talk a little bit about that trauma? You've, you've referenced it a couple times. Yes. Mostly I think that it was more a psychological trauma than it was a physical trauma. It was the kind of psychological trauma where, you, you know, when you grow up in the aura of your parents and when, what you're seeing in their eyes is negative. It, it influences those those parts of you as you're as you're growing up uh, that are trying to get their feet on the ground, trying to um, you know you're trying to establish your, your own personality. And uh, when you know when you have a father, for instance, that is telling you that you're ugly and you're stupid and that you're uh, uh, never going to find anyone to love you and 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 things like this, and keeps harping on those things, it attacks some of the, the most basic fundamental uh, core structures uh, uh, of, of your developing sense of self. And the psyche has a way of protecting itself when that happens. What happens is, is you, you, the psyche splits off those parts and drives them into the unconscious. So 
one of the from now this is my my psychologist side talking here um when that happens there's kind of an axiom in psychology that those kinds of of unconscious material uh uh try to to get out by projecting themselves out into the world they paint themselves on onto a particular um you know maybe a group of people or another person and we all know that uh uh that some people will scapegoat other people because for, for no particular reason. I mean, they, you know, you, you look at uh, the, the plight of the Jews, for instance, and how they're, they're scapegoated. Uh, that, that's on a large scale, but on an individual scale, you see this all the time too, where, you know, maybe you, maybe you don't like somebody, you don't even know why you don't like them. <laughs> so this is kind of a, a projection. Um, and so, what better way of of projecting out into the world my own internal self defenses than to look outside in the world for a practice that is based in self defense it, it's a it's a mirroring like that so this is kind of what i'm i'm after in the book and at different points in the book uh, I, uh, uh, I get closer to understanding that until I get to a point where, you know how they say about, you know, alcoholics, you know, you sometimes, or, or addictions where you, you have to hit rock bottom before you can go back up. And something like that happens to me where I drop everything. And, you know, we're talking about all this, all these books that I wrote and all these things that I've done, it all came to a sudden halt where I halted it. And I said, you know what? I've got to take what I found in the martial arts and I, I need to go find out about me. And so I, I closed down the school that I had. I had actually two schools, closed them down. I put everything into storage. I put what little I had uh, left into a, a, a backpack and I went into the woods you know, where my family had uh, a very old cabin that was, you know, uh, Nobody went up to that cabin anymore, so it was completely isolated, and that's where I went. Mm. Wow. Powerful, so powerful stuff. It's interesting because in, in one of the, the forums, they had a, a little uh, section that said, whatever happened to Michael Staples? <laughs> this is probably, somebody had written, you know, these are guys that go way back, and I guess they, they remembered my books, and maybe they had a few, and they were just wondering, you know, whatever happened to that guy? Well, this is what happened to that guy. <laughs> cool. Oh, that's yeah. fun. Thing. So I still feel like I'm practicing Kung Fu. You know, if Kung Fu is really uh, coming out of the Shaolin Temple, but what's the core of it? I mean, is it, is it, does it mean that I have to be uh, kicking and punching all the time? I don't think so. The core of Kung Fu back then was the meditative practices of the monks. And if, if it's true that Bodhidharma, uh, you know, uh, cooked up the the muscle change classic, and he, I mean, he probably didn't, but that's the idea uh, to keep to give his his monks something to do physically, uh, then you know that you, you can you can see the you know the the correspondence between uh, the two, but not to the exclusion of the meditation. Am I making any sense? <laughs> Absolutely. And and we talk about this on, on the show often that martial arts is really just a vehicle for personal development. Mm -hmm. It just happens to be under the guise of physical combat. Yeah. Because that yeah. works for people. You know, there are plenty of other ways of, of you know, pursuing enlightenment or, or self-actualization or whatever you want to call it. And, mm -hmm. you know, we just happen to pursue ours by beating on our friends. Right. And that's... <laughs> And this, that's what I, you know, that was, has been my interest. You know, it's, it's interesting when I came away from that, uh, uh, from, from the Wushu team. Now, the, now, Wushu has changed a lot since, you know, the, those days, you know, in, in the early 70s. Uh, but when I came away, I felt this, something's not quite right. Something's not quite right here. That I missed something in, in, uh, uh, in, in the interviews. There's something that's uh, it's not quite right, and that 
feeling of something not quite being right is something that I track throughout the book because I'm tracking it. I've been have been tracking it in myself. Now, what wasn't quite right, what I figured out with with my with the Wushu team was that there was this lack of of the spirituality uh, that China had sort of driven that out of the practice back then. Now, you know, it could be much different now. So, when uh, in some of my er early articles, uh, I, I was hard pressed to try to figure out what to call it, what to call Wushu. And I, I came up with performing art because it wasn't quite a sport at the time. In yeah. fact, China was playing down the whole idea of competition in sports. And it wasn't really a martial art. They were dead set against calling it a martial art. So, okay, what do you call it? <laughs> and what, uh, a performing art seemed, uh, seemed like, like a good bet. You know, because without the spiritual, without the fundamental core of, of that spirituality, um, uh, you, you have something quite different from what you had in the past. I mean, you know, Kung Fu, all, all these Kung Fu styles and uh, go back, you know, have an or origination story that leads back to some, you know, monk who's watching, you know, an ape or a crane or something like that. So it, it all goes back to that spiritual center. So, when, so I, when, I, when I recognized it in being a lack there, I recognized it as being a lack in me. Mm. Okay. You're giving me a lot to think about. Well, you can see how the, the book <laughs> now is, is a lot different from um, my books in the past where I was just sure. explaining, you know, that this is a, a really a really neat way of, of, of kicking and, and punching and, and stuff like that. And there's there's this so it's quite different from those. Without a doubt. Yeah. If someone let, let's let's kind of shift gears. You know, we we've talked about your book, we've talked about you, and I expect there are some people listening, quite a few people listening that are interested in learning more about your book and about you. How would they do that? Well, I have a website. Uh, it's uh, uh, focusingemptiness.com, and uh, you know, I I have a I don't know I have a uh, a, a Gmail address too. <laughs> I, I don't mind talking to people uh, about these kinds of things. I'm not right. like a recluse or something like that. <laughs> so they could uh, they could email me. Okay. Do, do, you want, do you want to know what the address is? Yeah, yeah. I, I find it works better when we when we say it. This is the one thing that I'm not always fond of putting on the show notes because it just invites robotic email harvesters to crawl across and add uh -huh. you to even more spam lists than you're probably already on. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's M P is in Paul Staples at gmail.com. And I try to answer, you know, whatever uh, somebody has questions. I, I'm more than happy to, to talk. Uh, and then I also have a the, the website. They can always go to the website. I'm trying to put put up more things on the website so that uh, you know I have a little. Uh, I don't have a forum, but I have you know. A, section there were a blog mm -hmm. and i'd love to have a, a forum too uh so maybe that's coming down the pipe yeah yeah and, and i just i just got through you know uh, with this book so it's just it's it's new so i'm building a kind of infrastructure around it awesome we're on the ground floor with you yeah <laughs> well, absolutely be... thank you very much for that by the you're, way you're welcome <laughs> i you're welcome it, it was it was an honor and looking forward to seeing how this goes and grows. And of course, if you had a forum, if any of these other things happen to pop up, you know, let us know. We'll put it out, you know, over social media. The, the people that have been around for a while know that we're always helping out our past guests, you know, letting letting our following know what's going on with all of them. Because we're all, you know, as martial artists, we're all family. We're all, you know, really trying to do the same thing. We're trying to better ourselves. And so how the more we can... Support each other through our endeavors, the better. Yeah, and this is a great idea. I mean, what a great idea to do this. I never. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it Thank really you. is fabulous. It's it's a lot of it's There's, a lot of fun. You know, back when I was writing these things, there was nothing. There was just absolutely nothing. I mean, 
my articles were being printed not because I was a great writer, it's just because <laughs> there wasn't anybody else doing it, you know. <laughs> so, and everyone was hungry to know about, you know, these different styles and these different yeah. personalities and, you know, all of this stuff. Uh, it's much, much more open uh, it, uh, now, and, and you're helping it along in, in this new, interesting way. Thank you. And there, there's still a dedicated core of us that are just as hungry as we've ever been. Mm -hmm. And we'll keep listening to podcasts and reading books. And, you know, we're the loyal few that continue to subscribe to martial arts magazines while the rest of the world says, what's a magazine? Right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It's been a lot of fun. So as we wrap up here, I'd like you to leave our listeners with a bit of advice. What parting words of wisdom would you share with everyone? Um, just to, to pay attention to what's going on for yourself, the more conscious you can become of what is driving you and, and what, what your interests are, uh, the less you'll be led around, uh, unconsciously by the nose. I had a lot of fun speaking with Mr. Staples. He's a vivid storyteller, isn't he? I wish I could have been there in those early days of his training. It sounds like he lived through a Kung Fu movie. That's kind of a dream of mine, you know, I suspect for many of you as well. Thank you, Mr. Staples, for your time on the show. Over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find the show notes with some absolutely wonderful photos that Mr. Staples sent us to post. You really should check them out. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. And our username is Whistlekick. You should also check out our Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes. We're always open to new guests for the show, so if you want to come on or recommend someone else, maybe your instructor or someone that you know who has awesome stories, head to the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Most of you guys probably know that address by heart by now, don't you? If you have any feedback, we'd love to hear that too. And, you know, we got a form over there on the website. Or if email is more your thing, info at whistlekick.com is the best way. If you like the show, make sure you're subscribing. And if you're up to help us out in some way, we've got a few ways. You can share the show with your friends. You can leave us reviews. iTunes is the best spot. You can join the newsletter list. You can get in on that Facebook group I mentioned. You can like us on Facebook or some other social media. And, you know, of course, we're never going to turn down a purchase. That's part of why we're here. We love making our sparring gear like our really comfortable, comfortable sparring helmets. I'm going to leave that one in just to show you guys that, you know what, I do mess up from time to time. Actually, way more than you realize. So check out our sparring gear. Try it out. Risk-free, free shipping, all that. Whistlekick.com. If you're a school owner or a team coach, remember, wholesale.whistlekick.com. Until next time. Train hard, smile, and have a great day.